for your mercy, your grace, your forgiveness. Uh, thank you, God, that the two things that you look at in our life is our faith and our heart. I pray tonight that you would uh, show us what our faith looks like. I pray tonight in this room that you would save some people. I want to pray that um, the next two nights it would be even bigger and better, God, that you'd fill this place up. So thank you, Jesus. Now, would you take your word in spite of me, and would you uh, take this clump of clay, this uh, voice box, this vessel, and God, would you um, give, get glory through this? We'll pray in your name. Amen. If, um, if you weren't here yesterday, you're here tonight, but you weren't here yesterday, raise your hand. Hold them up high. Let me just see. Put them up high. You're, you weren't here. All right. Very good. Um, I want to look quickly. I'm, I'm just debating. I thought I knew what I was going to preach, but I'm going to kind of wait on it a minute. Let me give you a thought, and uh, I'm into quotes. Um, my third book is, um, the, I just got an email today, and they're working on the cover. My third book's called Choices 101, and in the four-year, I've got my second book to called Toilet Bowl Christianity, and it's got a lot of my story in it. And, and I haven't decided if I'm doing my story tomorrow night or Wednesday night, uh, but I would encourage you the next two nights, uh, get people here. Um, I want to give you a thought um, in Hebrews chapter 11. Don't, you don't have to turn to it. But Hebrews chapter 11, it's, we know it as, we call it the what? We call it the faith chapter. I call it the heroes of faith. Now, if you're going to write something down, I'm going to give you three thoughts to think about, and then I'll figure out what I'm going to preach. That, that just messes my wife up. It really does. She's always asking me, what are you going to, I said, well, I, I think, I'm, what do you mean you think? I was getting ready to speak in a Dallas Reunion Arena, 30,000 students, probably 25 years ago, and um, we were back in the back, and, and I'm getting ready to go out and speak. The worship's kind of going down, and so we're praying before I go out, and there are about 20 of us in the circle, some high up people from, from the Evangelism Baptist office and all this stuff, and Finally, they said, we're going to pray. And they said, well, what are you preaching? <laughs> and I said, well, I'm not real sure. And one guy said, come on now, you're kidding. And I said, kidding about what? I said, I'm not really sure what I'm going to say. He said, dude, you're getting ready to walk out in front of 30,000 people. And you're not sure what you're going to say? And I said, well, I, evidently you heard me well. <laughs> I said, dude. I got plenty to say, but it's saying the right thing. And that night as I walked up on the stage, um, I just began to, to weep before I could say anything. And God gave me the word. And I, and I remember what I preached on that night. I shared a little of my story, but I talked about distractions, how distractions are dangerous and costly and harmful. And that night, we had almost 1,000 students come to Christ, even some adults. So evidently, I picked the right deal. But let me give you two or three statements that I wish you'd write down. Here's the first one. I did a series on, on faith at camp, and, and when I did, I looked at the heroes of the faith in um, chapter 11, Hebrews 11. Abraham was a liar, but he was a hero of the faith. <laughs> Moses actually murdered somebody, but he was a hero of the faith. Um, David who committed adultery, was a hero of the faith. I'm going somewhere with this. Samson was a hero, but he was a womanizer and very rebellious. Um, and so as you look through the heroes of the faith, I came to one, and uh, her, um, and, I, and I just, and her name escaped me, I'll tell you in a minute. Um, Rahab, the prostitute. Now, you have to understand something about Rahab. All she knew 
was going to bed with other people, so whoever and whatever. She hurt her family, destroyed her family with her life. But Rahab made a choice that changed the course of her life. In fact, she told these spies, she said, you know what, I'll hide you for the Lord if you'll save my family. And he did more than save, he saved her. And in chapter 11, she's one of the heroes of faith. Now, I'm going I'm to give you a great statement. Not one time in the book of Hebrews did God ever bring up any of their failures. You're not going to find in Hebrews 11 where it says, Now, Abraham, you were a liar. David, you, <laughs> are you ready for this? God's not concerned about our failures. This is a great statement I'm about to give you. He's only concerned about our faith. You see, God doesn't look at our past. He looks at now. And faith is a pretty cool, because tomorrow night, if I talk about the heart, there are two things that God looks at. He looks at our faith and our heart. And so here's the bottom line. God is, he, he will never bring up your failures. He only is concerned about your faith. If you're listening, say, I am. To me, that's a pretty incredible statement. And, and I really believe that our faith can make a difference in somebody else's eternity. Now, do me a favor, because I've changed my message. For you that were, I'll tell you about Oprah later. I'll just go ahead and tell you she's lost. So that's all you need to know. She, she's lost and needs Jesus. If you go to her website, if you go to Oprah's website, she's a new ager. She's, she has a class that literally millions of people sign up online. It's called the New Earth. And so she believes that you can kind of believe anything you want to believe and you're okay. But I want to go a different direction tonight. And this is just on my heart. Some of the, some of the worship kind of changed that. And, and if, you want, if you want what I was going to, if you want the... Uh, Oprah thing, it's right there on my table. It's called crickets, and you can go get it. Now, go to Luke. You know, you know, do me a favor. Go to Hebrews chapter 11. Let's start there. And then I want to tell you a story tonight that I hope will challenge you and your faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. We're going to look, look heavy at this. I want to give you three things. Will you write this down? Everybody say faith. faith. And this message, I call this message really the, the friends of faith is what I call it. So everybody say faith. faith. Does three things. Say faith. faith. Always, Always gets God's attention. I'm letting you write. Everybody say faith. faith. Always does the unexpected. Now I'm going to repeat them enough. We're going to say it a lot. Everybody say faith. faith. Always, Always gets God's attention. Say faith. faith. Always, Always does the unexpected. Now here comes the key. Everybody say faith. faith. Can't believe what circumstances tell you. Let me do it again. Say faith. faith. Can't believe what circumstances tell you. Now I'm going to prove this in a story, but I got to set it up. Let me tell you what faith is. Here it is. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. It says, "What is faith? It is the confident assurance of what we hope for is going to happen. It's the evidence of things that we cannot see. So everybody say faith, faith is what we can't see. So now you know what faith is. See, you know, we've got atheists and agnostics and stupid people. And all three of those need to go together. Because I'm here to tell you, you understand that atheists and agnostics, and if you're here tonight and that's who you are, <laughs> more power to you. Because I'm here to tell you this, it takes more faith not to believe in God than it does to believe in God. 
Let me give you a thought about faith. Everybody say, say a faith, faith that can't be tested, can't be trusted. I'm going to say it again. How many, of you, how many of you here struggle with your faith? Be honest. Come on, hold them up. How many of you, bills, you know, getting older, uh, maybe, um, you, you, you know, the fear, but how many of you really, be honest with me, you struggle with your faith? Raise your hand. Now, if you're not raising your hand, then maybe you, maybe you got it. And I'm not, saying, I'm not saying that you don't. But you see, a faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. Everybody say faith. faith. Always gets God's attention. Come on, be strong. Faith always does the unexpected. And say faith. faith. Can't believe, Can't believe. What, economy, what economy, what the weather, what bills, what, bills. what the world, what, the world. What, circumstances what circumstances tell you. Let's make sure we got it. Faith is what we can, not if you're listening, say I am. So now we know what faith is. Can I give you another thought about faith? Faith is not a luxury. Faith is a necessity. This church will never be the church it needs to be if it doesn't walk in faith, live in faith, trust in faith. Faith is a key in our life. So we know what faith is. Have you thought about the things that you put your faith in? Everybody say faith. When you walked into this room, if you did this, you're weird. I mean, I, I was watching you walk in. I didn't see anybody walk up to a chair and say, listen, I'm going to be sitting on you tonight. We need to talk. I weigh about 200 none of your business pounds. And I think if the chair could speak, it would say something like, Jenny Craig, <laughs> slim fast. Now, everybody look at me. When you came in, you put your, I knew someone was going to say, but. <laughs> you put your faith in, listen, as funny as that is, you put your faith in that chair. You don't even know, you don't, I mean, I, I wish we could have some collapsible chairs. Then it would make you think. But we don't think anything about it. We just come in and sit down. How many of you all have money in a bank? Say yes. How many of you would admit, like me, and I'm admitting it, you've ever been overdrawn in your bank account? Raise your hand. Have you noticed something? It's never the bank's fault. I mean, they never call, oh, our bad. <laughs> you got $500 more. See, everybody say faith. faith. So tonight, your money that's in the bank, they could be having a party with your money. Everybody say faith. faith. How many of you have ever gone to a doctor? Say yes. We don't even know if that's a real doctor. Well, they got a little plaque. They probably got that from Walmart. Amen. I'm just telling you, we don't know. I hate going to the doctor because my appointment's at 1030. But they don't see me till 1130. Can I get an amen? amen? Freaking me out. So one time I had an appointment at 1030. I showed up at 1130. She said, you're late. I said, usually I'm not. I said, I sit back in that room waiting. We don't even know if he's a doctor. But we put our... In the, and hopefully that he'll give us a good diagnosis. And then he writes out this little piece of paper. It's called a prescription. There are only two people in this world, three, that can read that prescription. The doctor, the pharmacist, and God. <laughs> How many of y'all have ever gotten a prescription? You could, you're th so you take it to the pharmacist. And we don't even know if he's a pharmacist. Y'all are laughing, but we do it. Everybody say faith. faith. 
and we give that piece of paper that we don't even know what's on it here. I mean, that doctor could be having a bad day. He might be mad at you. He might have wrote on the prescription. Give him a laxative. I don't like him. <laughs> Everybody say faith. faith. Always, Always gets God's attention. Gets God's attention. Does, the Does the unexpected. Can't believe, Can't believe. What, circumstances what circumstances tell you. Faith is what we can't. If you're listening, say I am. So you get that prescription. You know, you were a little sick, you said, and you get, and have you noticed that when you get that bag or, or the pill, it, it's got some side effects. May cause drowsiness. Now you won't know if it does until you take it. Now you go back because you're getting sleepy. So they give you another pill. May cause hives. Now you're itching in your sleep. <laughs> so then you go back. This has caused me to itch. All right, let me get, let's try another one. May cause vomiting. Now you're thrown up in your sleep. <laughs> My least favorite side effect of all. Are you ready? You'll fill in the blank. May cause severe Everybody say diarrhea. diarrhea. I just want to see if everybody would say it. I love the ladies that are real dainty going, I'm not saying it. So here's the deal. We put our faith in a banker. We put our faith in a doctor. We put our faith in a pharmacist. We put our faith in a prescription. We put our faith in a preacher or a parent or a friend. How many of y'all have ever? How many of y'all have ever ridden a roller coaster? Raise your hand. You're idiots. You just need to put a stupid sign on there when you get on. The next time you go get on the roller coaster ride, look at who's in charge. It's a 16-year-old boy. Hates you. Hates his job. And he buckles you in and goes. If you're listening, say, I am. So faith is what we can't. And a faith that can't be tested can't be. How many of y'all have ever flown in an airplane? How many of y'all have never flown in an airplane? I hope one day you're, it's your first time and you're with me. I fly every week. I love freaking people out. This couple got on. They were sitting in front of me. They were scared half to death. They're on their honeymoon. They're freaking out. They'd never flown. So I thought I'd have a little bit of fun. I leaned forward and said, so y'all you, just got married? Uh-huh. I said, so you've never flown before? Uh-uh. I said, I don't want to alarm y'all. But as I walked by, I heard the pilot and co-pilot say, this is the first time we've flown with people. <laughs> their hands turned white as they held tightly. When you walk on the plane, I, I never, I've never done this. You walk on the plane and you walk by the, the cockpit, the pilot and go by. You don't even know who they are. You walk by and you sit in your seat, put on your seatbelt, like that's going to save you. <laughs> and then they say weird stuff. And they wait for the plane to begin to take off when they say the stuff. Stuff like in case of an emergency. I'd have said that when we were on the ground. You know, oxygen masks, they may come out and, you know, they're you know, supposed to put it on. And they say this. Cause if the, and it happened to me a couple of times. When they fall, that means something's wrong. And then they say this to you. Get the mask, put it over your mouth, and breathe normally. Excuse me, but are we crashing? <laughs> hey, before we crash, can I get a Diet Coke? You know what? Make it a real Coke. <laughs> Faith is what we can't. A 
faith that can't be tested can't be. I'm going to tell my story. Faith is not a luxury. It's a, if you're listening, say I am. And then they say this. I love this one. First time I heard this, first time I actually was listening, they were getting ready to land, and they said this. This will be our final approach. <laughs> yes, sir. I just need to know how many times we tried this approach. <laughs> Never have I walked by, stuck my head in the cockpit, and said this to the pilot and co-pilot. Hey, I'm flying with you all today. I just want to make sure we got a good flight. So can I ask you a couple questions? Are, are both y'all married to, to Pete? Yes. Are, is your marriage going good? Are you having a good day today? Are your kids idiots? Are you suicidal or are you depressed? Are you an alcoholic, a drug? I just need to know. But you know what I do? Just what you do. I walk by, sit in my seat, put on my seatbelt. Are you ready? And I allow two people that I have no idea who they are fly me 30,000 feet in the air, and I put my faith in their hands. You see, faith, oh, by the way, let me show you something about faith. Look at Hebrews 11.6. We looked at it the other day, but look at it. Hebrews 11.6. Well, in fact, look at verse 2. God gave his approval to people in the days of the old because of their, look at verse 3, by faith, verse 4, it was by faith, Verse 5, it was by faith. Now look at verse 6. So you see, it's impossible to please God without faith. So we know what faith is. We kind of know what faith does. But Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace you are saved through. So you have to understand that God gives us faith to believe and be saved. That faith is... It helps us to please God. That faith, in spite of what's going on, makes us stronger. If you're listening, say I am. Now, go, if you would, to Luke chapter 5. Here's my story. Let me set it up. I really believe I'm heading the right way. Luke chapter 5. I'll tell you what verse in a moment. Don't turn to this, but when you get a chance, read Mark chapter 5. Now, I want to give you the biggest enemy to our faith. You know what the biggest enemy is? It's not the devil. You know what the biggest enemy According to Jesus, this is the enemy of faith. Everybody say unbelief. Now, you need to understand this. Because, see, faith sees um, answers. Unbelief has a lot of questions. You see, faith sees potential. Unbelief sees problems. They're both, and here, Jesus said, let me give you the story. Just listen, in Mark 5, there's three stories. There was a dude, he was demon-possessed. Listen to this. He would cut himself. They would chain him. He would scream. In the night, he would break the chains. Finally, Jesus showed up, and this demon-possessed man fell at Jesus' feet because the demons recognized who he was. And he cast the demons out, set the dude free. He was totally sane. And I believe this dude had a little bit of and that's what changed his life. And then he started telling everybody, hey, look what Jesus did. Jesus leaves there. That's a demon-possessed man. And he's walking with this crowd. And this Jairus walks up and he said, man, I've got a dying daughter. This was a desperate dad. So he leads the demon-possessed woman, runs into a desperate dad on behalf of his dying daughter. He said, Jesus, if you'll come, this is in Mark 5. You can look at it all. He said, I'll heal you. I mean, I believe you'll heal my daughter. So he heads on. While he's walking, hundreds of people are all around Jesus. This diseased woman had bled for all 12 years of her life. 12 years of her life. So we know that she was probably in her 20s because we know she was a woman. 
12 years of her life. She went to doctors, and I believe in doctors. She tried the medicine. She spent all her money. Instead of getting better, she got worse. So finally, Jesus is walking, and the Bible says that she touched the hem of his garment, which means she got on her hands and knees. They're probably kicking her out of the way, stomping on her. Her face is in the dirt, and she just touched the hem of his garment. So he leads a demon-possessed man who gets healed. A desperate dad is trying to get him to his dying daughter, and a diseased woman shows up. And as soon as she touched it, now watch this, guys. As soon as she touched his garment, the bleeding stopped instantly, and she backed away. See, you don't read the Bible like me. And Jesus just stood there. Everybody stopped. And Jesus said, who touched me? And everybody around him said, Jesus, we're all touching you. Touch, touch. Are you ready for this? Somebody touched Jesus with their, you need to listen. Guys, as long as you look and you try to see faith, you're going to end up in trouble. I mean, I got a lot of needs right now. There's stuff going on with my grandson and all this. And I'm here to tell you this. I keep telling my son, Jeremy, we got to believe what we can't see. That's faith. Finally, Jesus said, who touched me? And they said, Jesus, we're all touching. He said, oh, no, 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 Power came out of me. And so finally, this woman, are you ready? The demon-possessed man fell at Jesus' feet. The desperate dad fell at Jesus' feet. And the diseased woman who's now healed also fell at his feet. And, he, and she said, it was me that touched it. And here's what he said. He said, because of your you're healed. Now, that's in Mark 5. When you jump over to Mark 6, he goes to his own hometown. And all the religious people get upset. And as Jesus was leaving his hometown, here's what he said. Because of your lack of, because of your unbelief and your little faith, I wanted to do more, but you wouldn't let me. Unbelief is a huge enemy to faith. You see, unbelief sees obstacles. Faith sees opportunities. If you're listening, say I am. Now, go to Luke chapter 5 and go to verse 17. Let me tell you this story. Look at it. Let me set it up and we'll read it. Oh, I appreciate these guys. Man, these guys are good throwing up some scriptures. They are really they're, no, they're not good there. Great. How many of y'all had a great day today? Yeah. How many of y'all, when you began to talk, you, you, you could hear the word good, and you're thinking, that's wrong. Yeah. How many of y'all purposely tried to use the word great today? It freaks people out. I'm just telling you. We were, we were at Cheesecake Factory with my, my son, his wife, and his five kids, and we're at Cheesecake Factory, one of their favorite places, and we're and we just I just finished preaching at his church, and I actually preached Good Ain't Good Enough, and, and the waitress came up, and you could tell she was having a bad day. And all my grandkids, they were just going, man, this is great. This is the greatest place. That's the greatest cheesecake. Great! And finally the waitress, who was having a bad day, she says, well, I'm feeling great right now. <laughs> now let me tell you this story, then we'll read it. I want to prove to you, are you ready? Real, because faith will always get God's, the demon-possessed man, the diseased. Oh, by the way, the desperate dead, after the disease, diseased woman was healed, he went, they got to his daughter, and she was healed. See, all of those, their faith got God's attention. Are you ready? I'm telling you guys, if you ever get real faith in your life, it's going to change how you live. How you tithe, how you serve. So real. So here's the deal. Everybody say four friends. Now in this story, there's five friends. One of them, and they're all men. One was a paralyzed dude, and the other four friends were were fine. Let's see what happened. Look at it. One Jesus. One day while Jesus was teaching. The Pharisees and teachers of the religious, oh, they were all sitting there. It seemed that these men showed up. 
They came from Cabot. They came from Ashdown, Arkansas. They came from Fort Smith. They came from Springdale. They came from Fayetteville. They came from Bentonville. They came from Rogers. You see, when you read the Bible, if you'll try to do this, it makes it come alive. So they came from all over. How many of you here are from Rogers? Raise your hand. Anybody live here in Cave Springs? Raise your hand. Anybody from Springdale? Raise your hand. Well, I, anybody from Fayetteville? Raise your hand. Anybody from another town? Raise your hand. I don't need to, Now, are you ready? So we were, are you ready? So we all came. And by the way, I, I, this happened in a message, in a meeting where I was preaching, and I'll tell you about it. So these men showed up from every village of Galilee, Judah, as well as from Jerusalem, and the Lord's healing power was strongly with Jesus. Next verse. Everybody say some men. Now, if you do a little bit of studying, it's going to be four men. Say four friends. four friends. So these four friends had a friend that was paralyzed all his life. Look at it. So these four friends came carrying a paralyzed man, keep it there, on a sleeping mat. Now, guys, you've got to get the picture. The paralyzed dude was good to nobody or nothing. And so the four friends... <laughs> heard about Jesus. Maybe they heard about the desperate dead and the diseased woman. And in fact, right before this, Jesus heals a leper. The average lifespan of a leper is nine years. And this leper walks up to Jesus, and I've seen lepers. I've actually visited a leper colony over in Hawaii. A friend of mine has a church on Molokai, that island, and there's a, there's a leper colony. It's almost gone. And so when you get leprosy and you walk into a town, you have to say, unclean, unclean, and nobody will get near you. This dude walks in just a few verses before this, and Jesus touches him and heals him. So maybe the four friends heard about it. So the four friends got together, and I don't know, maybe they were Baptists, I don't know. Because if they were Baptists or religious, it would have happened like this. Well, what are we going to do? Well, we've got to get a friend to Jesus. Well, how are we going to do that? Well, let's vote on it. <laughs> Man, if we can vote on it, maybe we can get it in the budget and the bulletin. So the four friends voted that they were going to take their friend to who? Jesus. Well, let's look at it. Look at what he says. They came paralyzed men on a sleeping mat, and they tried to get through the crowd and get their friend to who? Not Benny Hinn, not Oral Roberts, but to who? Jesus. Now, they couldn't get their friend to Jesus because of the what? I'm telling you, uh, when I, in Nashville, uh, Phil will tell you, there were a couple times we couldn't get anybody else. It was packed. I've been in places where we could not get another person. I was in El Dorado, Arkansas a long time ago, and we spoke at a, one of their little auditoriums there, and two nights we probably turned away over 400 people. We couldn't get them in. So Jesus, watch this. These four friends are now carrying a paralyzed dude. <laughs> paralyzed dude probably sleeping. And I think the paralyzed dude had a little bit of not a lot, but a little. But the four friends had incredible, had great, had believing. See, they believed, are you ready? If they could get their friend to Jesus, he could heal them. So now the four friends carry him. And when they get there, they can't get in because of the... Now, we don't have to worry about that tonight. I mean, we can show up an hour and a half late. We're okay. So when they get there, they can't... So let's see if they did. Look and see if they did. They got mad and went home. Joined another church. Stop believing. That's the reverse standard version, right? Look at what they did. I think they got another committee together. Oh, guys, what are we going to do? We can't get him. We can't get him through the window. Can't... I know. Let's take him to the top of the roof. So they voted. Now, guys... The houses weren't big back then. And so I, don't, I still don't know how they got on top of the roof. But now they're on top of the roof with a paralyzed dude. 
Are you getting the picture? Now, this ain't a parable. This happened. So on top of the roof, the paralyzed dude. Jesus is underneath the roof teaching people. Finally, the paralyzed dude probably wakes up. He probably had a few questions. <laughs> like, what in the, I, he probably had a word. What are we doing? And I think, the par, I think the friends had a great answer. We're taking you to, I think he had another question. Why didn't we use a door or a window? <laughs> I think they had a good answer. There were people everywhere. Then I think he had the best question of all. What if you drop me? I think they had a great answer. You're not going to feel nothing. You're paralyzed. See, y'all don't read it like me. So now look and see what they did. So they began to take the tiles off of the roof. Now the paralyzed dude, what are we doing? Well, we're going to take you to Jesus. How are we doing this? They lowered him in the hole in the See, guys, you must not read it like I read it. And by the way, everybody here, including me, is in this story. So they lower their, the paralyzed dude in the hole in the right in front of <laughs> Y'all just don't read. <laughs> hey, Jesus. <laughs> just hanging. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> See, all are laughing. He didn't get to sit on the back. Hey, Jesus. Yeah, just hanging, paralyzed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Look at verse 20. Look at it. This may be one of the most powerful verses you'll ever see. The four friends are still holding him some way, somehow. He's hanging in front of Jesus. Seeing there. Wow. When Jesus saw there, he didn't look at their how much money they had. He didn't look at the, the color or their social status he saw there. If you don't turn to it, but in James 2, faith without works is, works without faith is, you show me your faith, I'll show you my works. You show me your works, I'll show They got to go hand in hand. So faith is what we can't. It's impossible to please God without. And we're saved by grace through. Guess whose faith he saw? The four friends. When Jesus saw there, and their actions were right in front of him. Guys, and pastor, nobody can tell me this. I don't know if anybody knows. I don't know how far they walked with this guy. I don't know what it cost them to get there. But they were, listen, every time I preach this, I pray that I can have that kind of faith. Do you remember the young lady that was climbing a mountain with her friends and her parents? Do you remember a few years ago? And she got, she cut her leg and uh, some kind of serious infection. She went into a little bit of a coma. They cut off both of her legs. They cut off both of her hands. Drop dead gorgeous young lady. They thought she was going to die. She's alive. She was on Katie Kirk and one of those shows. I saw her. And I remember, though, after she had, had cut off her hands and, and, uh, and both of her legs, somebody interviewed her parents, and they said, you know, what are you, what are you thinking? And here's all they said. The only thing that's bringing us through is our And this young lady said, I can still sing. I can still see, I can talk, I can feel. That's faith. So he saw their faith. And Jesus turned and he said, Young, I, and I, 
Some version says man, some version says son, this says young man, but there's a version, I think it's the NIV, the NIV says friend. Now watch this. The paralyzed dude got to Jesus because of, of his friends and their Now you got to listen. He looked to the young man and they brought their friend to be what? Healed. And Jesus, watch this. He said to the dude, your sins are forgiven. <laughs> now the friends ain't leaving until their friend gets healed. And so he's hanging here. Hey, hey dude, your sins are forgiven. Thanks, Jesus. I need to tell you something real quick. I still can't feel nothing. You know, I preached this for years, and it was probably two years ago when I came up with this, or God gave it to me. Salvation's not about a feeling. It's not about a feeling. It's about faith. The paralyzed dude could feel nothing. Now, you got to think about this. The paralyzed dude wasn't athletic. He wasn't popular. He wasn't rich. But he had four friends that believed if they got him to Jesus, he'd be healed. So he saves him. Read on with me. Verse 21, here comes the idiots of the law, the dorks and the dorkies. This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Look at verse 22. He says, why are you thinking these things? Now, can I say something about Jesus? He didn't have ESP. Okay? He wasn't psychic. Have you noticed how the psychic thing's kind of gone away? Do you remember when it was really hot? Was her name Cleo? Do you remember Miss Cleo? Psychic. About 3 o'clock one morning, I turned the TV on and psychic came on. And underneath it said, if you'll call this number now, you get eight minutes free. So I called it. I'm going to give this psychic a shot. Because they're supposed to know stuff without knowing you. Conversation went like this. I wish I would have taped this. I said, is, uh, I said, who is this? And they said, well, who's this? I said, you don't know my name? Are you a psychic? And they said, yes. And I said, well, shouldn't you know my name? Who is this? And then they said this, why are you calling? I said, you don't even know that? <laughs> Sir, where are you from? I said, you're not a very good psychic. I said, are you a Christian? No. Do you want to be? No. I said, I'm not psychic, but if you don't get saved, I know this. You're going to hell. And I hung up. <laughs> now, you can have so much fun, but here's the deal. Jesus knew what they were thinking. And so he said to him, look, we're almost done. Look at it. Why do you think this is blasphemy, verse 22, verse 23? Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or get up and walk? In order for Jesus to, hey, blind dude, you can see. Hey, you can't hear? Now you can. Hey, leper, you're clean. Hey, you want to walk? Go ahead and run. But in order for Jesus to forgive us our sins, he had to die. Now, keep going. Verse 24. I'll prove that I, the Son of Man, have authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed dude and said, Stand up, take your mat, go home because you're healed. <laughs> now, I'm going to tell you why I think Jesus did what he did. Salvation is eternal. Physical healing is temporal. And he needed... God's, are you ready? God's more concerned about the things that are eternal than are temporary. Look at verse 25. What's the very first word, in, or the second word in 25? And 
Now we know they weren't Baptists. Because we don't do anything immediately. And immediately, he jumped up to his feet. Don't miss this. As everyone watched, the four friends in the hole in the roof. And the man jumped up and picked up his. You better underline that. You know, because see, you, those are little things that you miss. The very thing that carried him all his life was the very thing that he carried out. Now, before I finish the story and tell you how I saw this happen, some of you are saying, well, Brother Ken, uh, I'm not paralyzed. Oh, really? Let's go ahead and discuss this again. How many of you worry? Are you ready? Your worry will paralyze you. You know what I found out about worry? Worry will rob you of your sleep, will rob you of your, your, your age, and uh, will rob you of a lot of things. How many of you, there's fear in your life? Raise your hand. Fear will paralyze you. How many of you um, have deal with things in your past? Raise your hand. Your past will paralyze you. If you have addictions and habits, they will paralyze you. If you've got hate or unforgiveness, they'll paralyze you. Tomorrow night or Wednesday, and I'm leaning towards Wednesday doing my story because I'd been saved for three years, but I was still paralyzed. Now, here's what I want to tell you. Don't answer out loud. You see, unbelief will paralyze you. When you walked into this auditorium, what carried you in here? Your worry, your hate, your jealousy, your anger. You see, the very thing that carried that guy all his life was the very thing. He walked out. They made a path for him to get out. The four friends now have jumped off the roof. And this dude went home praising God. Now, you got to listen. I think the dude, when he got out, he hugged his four friends for the first time. See, he knew they loved him. But for the first time, he felt their love. And I think when he got home, he started looking for more paralyzed people. I could almost hear the conversation. Hey, dude, <laughs> paralyzed? Yeah, I, I, I was there just a couple days ago. Would you like to be healed? Uh-huh. All right, here's what you need to do. Go to sleep. I'm going to find four of your friends. When you wake up, you're going to be on top of a roof. <laughs> Isn't the Bible a pretty cool book? Now watch this. The four friends would have, oh, let me just say this. The paralyzed dude may have never been healed may have never been saved if it hadn't been for four friends. I was in Jackson, Tennessee, Englewood Baptist Church. Her name is Kim. Kim and I have just recently talked again. She's probably 40 now. This is probably 15 or so years ago. I preached on my second service, and I noticed there were like 1,500 in both services. I noticed at the back of the church, this woman came in with a walker. I now, I've been telling the story with a little bit of <laughs> what I best I could remember. And so I called her and said, can you help me? And really, it was, a, it was a son and a daughter and a couple of other friends. And they were kind of on each corner of the walker. And she walked in, 35 years old. She wasn't a believer. Her leg was as twisted, and I... She had something, but when she walked, I mean, you could, you could feel the pain. She'd been that way for years. These, her two kids had heard me at a camp or somewhere. So they got on my website, and they saw that I was going to be in this church, and so they brought her. So she came. She sat in the back. They got there late. I preached. The invitation came. I want to forget it. 
And a lot of people came forward, but I noticed that she stepped out, grabbed her walker, her son and daughter and somebody else who was with them came with her, and she walked up to me, and she said, uh, I'm tired of being angry, tired of being mad. Uh, I need God to save me, and she got saved. That night she came back, she actually sat on the front row, and they baptized her. She came back out, and um, I preached, and we had more saved. At the end of the service, I, 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 I felt really strong to do this. I said, Kim, would you mind, and I put a cheer up here, would you mind coming sitting in this chair? Now that you're saved, and I said, I want to pray for God to heal you. And I've done this. My wife has fibromyalgia, and we've gone to healing services. We've done it all, and uh, she still has it. So uh, I just said, you know, there's nothing about me, but I'm just going to, the Bible says that if, you know, you call the elders, whatever. So I called some of the deacons up, and um, we didn't have any oil. <laughs> I saw you all in the back there. But uh, we didn't have any oil. And you're going to laugh. And my skin is oily, and I was sweating. So I grabbed a little bit of my oily sweat, and I said, Kim, I'm not doing this to be funny. And I just touched her head. And I said, in the name of Jesus, we as a body pray for you to be healed. That's all I prayed. She cried a little bit, and, and uh, people after it was over said, hey, we're going to be praying for you. That was on. So she's say oh by the way another reason she got to that church was she worked at a preschool and um, somebody there one of her friends kept inviting her and finally she came along with her kids who had heard me and she got saved monday grows around and she's at the daycare basically because she couldn't walk a lot she was at the receptionist she was across the room and the phone rang, and so she grabbed her walker, headed to the phone, picked it up, and her mom, who worked there as well, was sitting. She had a couple kids on her lap, and the mom was just looking at her. And Kim kind of said, hey, hold on. She held the phone to her chest. She said, Mom, what is up? And all her mom could do was point. Now, I've only seen this once or twice in my life. And when Kim looked down, because she had a little bit of a limp, her leg had completely torn back normal. She had a little bit of a limp, but she didn't hurt. Of course, she sat down. She began to weep. That's on Monday. Monday night, she comes back to church without a walker. A little bit of a limp. She ain't hurting. People are freaking out. So she gets saved Sunday morning, baptized Sunday night, healed on Monday. A couple of days later, she goes to the doctor in Nashville, and I encourage her to go. So she walks in with no walker. <laughs> the doctor says, what's up? She said, well, I, I was saved Sunday morning, got baptized Sunday night. As you can see, I was healed on Monday. So they did all the x-rays, and when they sat down, she said the doctor looked at me, and he said, I'm not supposed to say this as a doctor. But all I can tell you is, it's a miracle. You sh your leg should not be normal as it is. Now, I'll tell you why, and I, I've only seen that once or twice in my life. And she, her testimony has been incredible from there on. Are you ready? She may have never gotten to that church if that friend had given up on her, if her son and daughter hadn't invited her. Now listen to me. There are people that you work with, live with, go to school with that have been paralyzed. And here's what i got to tell you. If everybody here tonight would bring two or three people tomorrow night, we'd pack this place out. We could see the glory of God. Now, all of us have been paralyzed in some way. But here's the question tonight. If your heart were to stop, now listen close, because I really believe some people left lost last night. Last night, I don't know that we had anybody saved. That's happened to me maybe on two or three hands in over 30 years I've been doing this. 
maybe on three hands. I very seldom don't see anybody get saved. Now, I need you to listen close. Don't stop listening. If I do my message tomorrow night on the heart, I'm going to show a little clip of my son. Prayed a prayer when he was eight, grew up in my home, baptized him or I got him wet. Now, you're going to hear it from his own mouth. By the time he was 12, 13, he was skipping out of church, sitting at the back. He went to a great, a great Christian school. I've been speaking at it lately. And he said, Dad, by the time I was 13, I knew I was lost. Look at me now. He said, Dad, every time if I stayed for chapel or if I went to church, if they asked if I was saved, I'd raise my hand. But he, he, he said this, I knew in my heart that I was lost. Now, you that were saved Sunday morning, man, we need to baptize you. Tuesday, Wednesday, get, it, it needs Sunday. So here's my question. Do you have saving faith in your life? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Real still, he's going to begin to play real soft.